you have your Bible, turn to the 78th Psalm. The 78th Psalm, and in a few moments we'll go to 1 Samuel 4. Psalm 78 in the Old Testament. Easy to find. Just a few steps away from the 23rd Psalm. You got to say, I got it. We want to read verses 61 down through 64. Verses 61 down through 64. And the Bible says, let's read together. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was very angry with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men, and their maidens had no wedding song. Their priests were put to the sword. Amen. Today I want to speak from the uh, topic in part four of our series, The Lord's Help. When worse comes to worst. When worse comes to worst. We've been talking about help coming from God these last three weeks and talked about how God will change things for the better. If you doubt that, just ask somebody near you and ask can God make a difference? And I'm sure you'll get at least one volunteer from your role to tell you how God can change a life for the better. God does believe in us doing things on our own and using our might and our own strength and our intelligence and our gifts. But he wants us to know he's a good daddy. And he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We have uh, had an opportunity to do quite a few of topics within this particular subject, and I don't have time to go over all of the ones A through G that we've had. I would suggest that if you don't have a tape or a DVD, just get one. Or see, We have spaces in all our bulletins. You can just write the notes. I'm sure you all have done that already. Last week, we dealt with number G, or a part G, and G dealt with the fact that we have the ability to make things worse. I think I remember that last week. And we talked about the whole idea of what worse is and worse being something that's more unfavorable or more unpleasant or more painful. You look at the Bible and read it for its history value. It records what happens when a people become immoral. A moral people turn their back on God or turn their hearts from the one they vowed they'd always love. And that's what happened time and time again. It seems like sometimes when you read the Old Testament, Children of Israel were just crazy. They had it good. They had a good God. And have you ever read this and go, why did they do that? But over and over again, they would turn their back and they would backslide. And, and so we talked about the whole idea of making a bad thing worse. And sometimes it's what we do. We think we're making things better and we make things worse. They had lost this war that they should have won, but they lost because they had, they had the right weapons, but they had lost their moral compass. And I believe that there's such thing as a, a spirit of a nation. I think there's a certain thing that, that God looks at. So last week we talked about how bad is an event, but worse is a lifestyle. I believe that the Bible teaches the law of transfer. I believe that there's a reason why the, the old men of God and women of God, but specifically the fathers and the grandfather, before they would die, they, were, they would rest their hands on the head of their, their sons and their daughters, and they would release to them a blessing. It seems religious. It seems like just something folks would do, but if God is real, then there is the ability inside of you to leave more for your children than just money. There's something you can leave for your children and your grandchildren, your children's children, that a lawyer cannot make sure is read through a will. It is something that is tied to the will of God, and it runs through the bloodline of men and women. And when you lay hands on those children, you see it all through Scripture, and some of us know that the reason why we are so blessed today is because somebody prayed for us. Nothing wrong with the education. Nothing wrong with the degrees. I praise God for that. And I, I, I implore you to get all the education you can. But there is something that you can add to your diploma that no one can ever take away. It's the blessing of God. 
the writer said, the blessing of God maketh rich as no sorrow to it. There is no recession with the blessing. And there are some things that does not, it's not subject to Wall Street or anything else. I'm a witness to that. I can stand before y'all right now and tell you that God does that. And so I believe that you can bless your children, your sons and your daughters. But I also believe you can transfer a curse to them as well. And so these people, Reverend Dice, instead of what they should have done, I believe, was adopting a spirit of repentance. Get before the Lord and say, okay, Lord, somewhere along the line, we messed up. And we're going to seek your face, Lord. Instead of doing that, they did the quick thing. They made things worse. And so they run out and they get this, uh, go, and, go to a place they shouldn't have gone. And, and they wrestle away the Ark of the Covenant and they lose 30,000 men. They go back and they lose more men. They lose the ark. They lose their leadership. They lose all their, most of their foot soldiers. And today I want to give you one point. Last week's point was we have the ability to make things work. So let's write H on your notes, number H, or letter H, and put down worse spreads. When worse comes to worst, Write down the word spread. I believe that sometimes it's not your fault, but it is your burden. I believe that, yeah, the Bible does say, Sister Angie, that what a man reaps, he sows. What he plants, he has to harvest. I believe that, but I do also believe that there are people that go through rough times in life or a whole rough life, not because of something they did but because something someone else did. The word spread is on the screen. The word spread means to distribute something, either over a period of time or, here's what I say, among many persons. I believe that sometimes people spread their mistake into other people's lives. Now, because I've been in ministry a little while and because I've also been a counselor in high school, I mean college, and I've been a football and basketball coach, and I've been had the opportunity to invest in young people's lives. And uh, uh, the thing I've heard a lot of great things come out of people, and a lot of responsibility. But I have also heard this line from people that say when they start messing up their lives, they will say, "I'm just hurting myself. Why don't you leave me alone? I'm just hurting myself. If I do it, I ain't hurting nobody." But me, do you know that might sound like it makes sense when it comes out of your mouth? But rarely is that statement true. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, last week we ended in verse 10 and 11. And we talked about, we ended up talking about how the war ends and how the men are, are defeated and there's only a few left and... They've lost the ark, and the two priests are dead. And that seems like that should be enough. Because they, they went to, listen, they ran into that thing all on their own, and you would think that that was enough. But if you look at verse number 12 in the Bible, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, i like for you to read with me this statement here we'll actually set up the rest of our time together. Verse 12, the Bible says what? That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust. I'd like for you to actually circle the phrase in your Bible that same day. Notice what happens within 24 hours of a bad decision. Can I be honest about it? It don't take long for things to start going wrong. I believe, Reverend Dice, it was God that told the writer, make sure people know that everything they're going to read about happened within 24 hours. Didn't take a week, didn't take a month, didn't take nine months. It says that same day. That same day. It started affecting folks. Sometimes one phone call leads to another phone call. When on that same day, sometimes you get a tweet or a text and it just starts a whole bunch of stuff. The sun had not yet gone down, but that same day, Brother Maurice, 
The dust had not yet cleared, says the Joyetta, from the battlefield. And the Bible said it was about to go from worse to worst. Worse is more unfavorable, but, but worst is the most unfavorable, the most bad, the most evil, the most corrupt, the most uncomfortable, the most unpleasant, the most painful. And all of this happens within 24 hours. Now, they say that our world is so small that we all just have six degrees of separation from somebody or something. I'm going to run through these scriptures quickly, and I want you to write the numbers one through six. I'm not going to put the, the topics up on the board. I'm just going to put the scripture on the board. I want to show you some things that happen here when worse comes to worse or when worse spreads. Number one, when worse spreads, it changed and it still changes the character of a man. The Bible says, look what it says. The Bible says that same day, what? A Benjamite did what? He ran from the battle line. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you because Benjamin was one of the quieter sons uh, 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 of, of, and one of the, the quieter people in Scripture. But the Benjamite men, the, Benjam, the, the, the sons of Benjamin were known to be warriors. You know, everybody got somebody in their family that know how to pray and know how to sing and know how to be lazy. And everybody got somebody in their family. Stop now. Stop now. Don't go there that know how to fight. They fight from the time that two years old, they always, stop fighting your brother. Stop fighting your sister. That's what the Benjamites were. They occupied positions both of commercial dominance and military dominance among the Israelites. If they wanted to make sure that their, their borders were safe, they said, put the Benjamites on the border. Ain't nobody going to get in as long as Benjamin's boys are there. There was something about them. They, they were also the greatest experts in their, entire, uh, in their entire world when it came to archery. Not only could they handle a sword, they could handle bows and arrows uh, so that people were scared of them. History says of the Israelites, the first judge of Israel was a Benjamite. He started out that whole line, and he was a Benjamite, and his name uh, was... It's hard for me to pronounce. <laughs> Ehud. His name was Ehud, and Ehud was not just known to be a judge. Ehud was left-handed. And because the people in those days were so superstitious, they were afraid because he not only was a judge, he was a warrior, and he, and he carried his sword on the opposite side. And when he would fight, he would fight with the opposite hand it would throw people off. In the New Testament, one of the greatest writers and apostles we know, Saul of Tarsus, became Paul. Paul was a Benjamite. He was from the line of Benjamin. And he did everything hard. When he persecuted the church, he killed folk. And when God converted him, God knocked him off his horse. Because with a fighter, you got to convince them. You can't talk to a fighter. You got to knock a fighter down in order for them to respect you. And after 30 years of service for the Lord, he writes down his epitaph. And in his epitaph, there is a Benjamite phrase. I have fought the good fight. And so when you read that a Benjamite runs from the battle line, it is totally against his character. Benjamites ran to fight, and here he runs away. He drops his instruments of war, and he drops his shield, and the Bible says his clothes are torn. And his hair has dirt in it. Not the in image of a Benjamite warrior, but a person that is full of grief and defeat. When people make bad decisions, it changes the character of folk. It is why sometimes you find yourself disappointed in people you know is better than that. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but have you ever said to somebody you know, I don't even recognize you anymore. 
You've changed. What happened to you? So number one, when worse comes to worse, change is carried. Number two, write it down. We're there. When worse comes to worse and worse spreads, a judge in the Bible questioned his own decision. In the Bible, the Bible, y'all, y'all Bible students, y'all know that in, in the Old Testament, there were 15 judges over 480 years. And, and, and these were God's people. From the time that Joshua died until Saul became king, there were 15 judges. And they were to be the special deliverers, those special folks that God would put in the midst of his people to make sure they were delivered. When you get a chance, read Judges chapter 2. If you think I'm, I'm kidding, it's not, it's not see, anybody can be a pastor nowadays. I don't mean no harm, but don't take a whole lot. Rent for, rent for a building, some folks will follow you, you be a pastor. But, but the reality is, is that when you look at what, how God would do things, in Judges chapter 2, read this thing, it'll mess your mind up. Be careful how you treat appointed authority. The Bible says in Judges chapter 2, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but verse 18, there's a scripture that will blow your mind. It says in verse 18, I can't read off, but I repeat, it says, it says, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them. First of all, when God raised up a leader, he raised them up for them. Think about that now. The Bible says whenever the Lord would raise up a judge for them, he was with the judge. Who? It says God was with the judge. And the Bible says God would save them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. So even though Samson had an anger problem, the Philistines couldn't do nothing as long as he was alive. And here is Eli, who is not the greatest judge, but he is a judge. And one of the things he had was longevity. But when you read in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 13, y'all still with me? The Bible says when he arrived, when the man arrived with the news, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. Put a circle around that part, watching because his heart feared. For the ark of God. That was not a tenant or a gift that judges. Fear was not what they were supposed to have. But here's a question I have for y'all in church today. Have you ever had a feeling that you couldn't shake? I'm not, I'm not talking spooky spiritual. But have you ever had a feeling in your heart you just knew that something was coming? It's like the first sniffle before you get a cold. Have you ever felt in your heart... I, I'm just going to stay up till they get home. Have you ever thought, you know, just something's not... Now, now, now. Back in the day, before we had all this communication equipment and stuff, we, we, we had to, we had to, our senses were sharper. But that's what Eli knew. Eli had allowed the ark to leave Shiloh, and now he was second-guessing himself. Now, now, you understand how judges are. Judges, they, they make a decision, and that's it. It's, all, it's over. This week, the, the Supreme Court made a horrible decision that may change the way our country is governed. And I believe it because Obama's the president. For the first time in the history of this nation, they've made it legal this past Tuesday for corporations to give as much money as they want to give in any election in the land. So if a soda pop company wants somebody to be the president of the United States, they drop a billion dollars on it. For the first time, Halliburton can control who's in the Senate. Because people don't understand the move of God. And if God can get a black man in the White House, we have to look to our power, which is our money. And you can sit there and act like you know what I'm talking about, but that's how it works, boo. This whole idea of now, this will never happen again. The people will never have the power again to pull this. Because what, what happened a year ago this week, Y'all can listen to Fox News and all these nuts all you want to, but that man is in the White House because God moved. Yeah. 
And I have it on good authority. It's going to be all right. But here's a judge that finds himself weak, but he has sufficient spiritual sensitivity to be aware of the danger that happens when you make a decision that's totally against God's will. Number three, when worse comes to worse, it transformed the whole spirit of a people. Bible says in 1 Samuel 4, verse 13, when the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Side note real quick in your Bible, circle the, 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 the part where it says, told what had happened. We live in what I call, Sister Talay, the generation of information. With all the tweeting and texting and talk shows and all that. It's a generation of information, not so a generation of knowledge. There's a difference between knowledge and information. Because a lot of stuff on TV is just flat out silliness. And I, I would dare say that a lot of stuff that folks tweet and text to each other, I'm not a tweeter. But I do know that some of this Facebook should go masked. And I believe that we want information. Not now. I notice here, Reverend Dice, it says, it says, he told what had happened. And I want to give a warning to people that if you want to keep a secret, don't do it. Because somebody going to tell it. You can't listen. You can, listen, I don't care if you're a pro athlete or a, a, a politician. Folks going to tell it. There are very few secrets in this generation. If it is a secret, they're just holding it. Oh, come on, y'all wake up. They're just holding it till it's better used. The Bible says, Dr. Anderson, when the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town. Set up a cry. See, just hours before, not far from there, thousands of men and women were shouting. But there's a difference between shouting and crying. And there's a noise coming from our community now, and, and we've shifted back and forth from shouting and victory to cries of anguish. And this all happened within 24 hours. The same day. Number four. Y'all stay with me? Yeah. When worse comes to worse, when worse spreads, it exposes even weak leadership. Yeah. What the worst does, it, it exposes weak leadership. Rain will expose the cracks in the roof. Storms will, will, will expose bad sewer systems. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in L.A. today because we can handle the rain here. We got sewers, Brother Otis. I've been to L.A. It's pretty near thing, but their sewer's about that big. It's like a pipe. And the reality is they're making people move away from the ocean because they're having mudslides. That's what bad decisions and storms do. The Bible says, when you get a chance, look at it. Eli heard the crying and asked the man, what's going on? I'm trying to read all that. And, 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 and the man comes to Eli and he says, well, they, they, we went into war and 30,000 foot soldiers died. And, and your son were killed. And then finally, Brother Deacons, in verse number 18, the Bible says, but when he mentioned the ark of God, when he told Eli that he's going to close your church, when he told Eli because of what you do, they're going to foreclose on your house, when he told Eli they're taking your car back, everything that you said you were, you were, it, it, it's no more because without God, you ain't got no church. Because of your decision, Eli. They took the ark. The Bible says what? Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man, and he was heavy. 
and he had led Israel for 40 years. Now, as I said before, this is for information's sake. How does a great people become a not so great people? Sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes it's those you have in leadership and those that are supposed to be governing and those that, that you voted in. And, and, and the reality is, is that storms and bad decisions and recessions, they expose weak leadership. He was a good man, but he was a man with glaring weaknesses. I believe that Eli's greatest weakness was not his prayer life. I believe Eli's greatest weakness was his overindulging of his family. He could not say no to his kids. And whatever his kids did, he just washed over it. He was the pastor, but he gave his kids a pass. And so when his kids committed adultery, he just gave them a pass. So subsequently, he made his children weak, as well as his nation. And the Bible says, y'all still with me? When he mentioned, listen, when he mentioned the ark of God, Eli had a tipping point. It's when the hot water starts boiling over. Remember last year we talked about a tipping point? When you get to that spot where it just changes the way the Bible says, literally, he just tipped over. Metaphorically, he, he had a tipping point. It was too much bad news. And the reality is his worst fears have been realized. Let me say this to you before we leave here today. Uh, this is not a kingdom. This is, this is a republic. And because of the republic, we don't have royalty. We don't have, I know you might think it because the mayor has had the same last name as his daddy. And, and I understand that there's been two bushes in the White House. I do understand that. I do understand. But this is not a kingdom. You cannot pass on the right. In a kingdom, the king owns everything. But that ain't the case. Daly don't own Chicago. I'm sorry. So therefore, he does not own me. I praise God for him. I pray for him. He's my mayor. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not owned by Daly. But let me say this to y'all. Every election is important. Don't you do what they did in Boston. The reason why there's a Republican senator is black folks came out 13%. We went back to being, yeah. That's how he won. We went from 75% voting in Massachusetts a year ago to 13% on Tuesday. Every, uh, when this election comes up, in two weeks, you vote. Vote and vote against old mindsets. Eli spirits, fat cat politics. Vote your interests. Vote for people that talk to you more than once every four years. No, they didn't all come over here. Because I ask them questions. I refuse to let people get them to talk in front of you that they never talked to you before. They don't know my people. Please don't get mad at me. Get up and say something before the people and leave before the sermon's over. Away with such foolishness. Number five. When worse comes to worse, y'all still with me? Because I want you to understand that some stuff that happens around you, even in your neighborhood, it's not your fault, but you got to deal with it. When worse comes to worse, when worse spreads, sometimes it destroys whole families. Eli is dead. Both his sons are dead. But there's something about worse that when a family is infected with a certain spirit, sometimes it spreads through the whole family. Even when the people it's spread to is not even in the same place as the folks in their family. Look at verse 19, sisters. The Bible says his daughter-in-law, who Eli's daughter-in-law, who is he? Comma, the wife of Phineas, Mrs. Phineas. She was pregnant, and she was near the time of delivery. Yeah. Circle that part, near the time of delivery. In my study, the more I study about this sister, 
I realized that she was a strong, sensitive, but strong woman. She was a survivor. When you read about Mrs. Phineas, you realize that she had survived the infidelity of her husband and everything was all right again. That she, she made it through that part. She had survived some of the issues in the church, the embarrassment of her husband and her brother-in-law, things they had done, and they were cool again. Things were going well. Uh, uh, the marriage was back on track. She's expecting a baby, and she's almost due. She's a survivor, but the Bible says here, when she heard the news, circle that. I wish I had time, Reverend Dice. To, re to preach really the way I want to about the power of bad news. I don't have time, but I want sisters and brothers to understand there is power in words. There are power in words. When people say you're free, uh, your, 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 your debt's been forgiven, bless you, there's power in words. And though she's in a happy time, or her girlfriends are around her, she's about to have another child, things are going well, my husband's on a business trip, they tell her your husband is dead, your brother-in-law is dead, your father-in-law is dead, and uh, by the way, there won't be no church this Sunday. They're closing the church down. Your, the place where you get your faith to come back from your issues, sis, it's, we're closing that down because there, there, there is no one to bring the word, and there's no, there's no power of God there. The Bible says, she was pregnant near the time of delivery, and when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she, she went into labor. She wasn't due. She was almost due. She went to labor and gave birth. The Bible says that this was bad news, and bad news does not only travel fast, but bad news punches very hard. It's, it's hard on people. And the Bible says her, her labor pains, for the first time in scripture, labor pains kill somebody. The thing that they're supposed to announce or pronounce or herald in the birth of new life uh, kills her, not because they're labor pains, but it's labor pains attached to heart pain. I thank God for strong sisters. Some of y'all in here are the strongest people I've ever met in my life. But there is a power to bad news. If you have your notes, I'll write down the word press. The word press means to, 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 to be bared down upon or to bear down upon. And, and she had gone through a lot and she recovered from a lot, but this news bared down on her. It was pressing her. And press leads to pressure. Write it down. Some of you all must understand why it is your smile is gone. And you've now developed this painted on thing that you call a smile. Some of you wonder, even though you don't have no disease, why your hair is falling off. You've been pressured. The word pressure means the burden of distress. There's an old boxing anthem that says that if a fighter puts pressure on people, they can win. He may not have the best, uh, the best uh, jab, but pressure will, will, will win the fight for you. I've heard boxing trainers say that pressure will bust a pipe. Yeah. Pressure will also cause you to be traumatized. Right. And trauma kills. It may not kill you, but it will kill your dreams. It will kill your smile. Here she is in this wonderful state, and the Bible says she was overcome by her labor pains, and she has this trauma, this mental injury, this, this injury that is this bad news. Her father-in-law, Eli, had already become a victim of trauma, and here is this young woman in the prime of life, and I want you to understand sometimes People don't understand the pressure that you're under. Bible says she was dying because of the pressure. And her girls didn't understand. The women attending her said, don't despair. They were the closest to her. They could not even be in her attendance unless they were in her financial class. These were the closest women to her. And they did not understand why she was so sad. Here she is dying, and her girls say, it's going to be all right. And usually that's okay. But they don't understand the effect of trauma on this sister. So she's dying. They said, don't spare. Girl, you got a brand new son. But the Bible said, look at what it says here. She did not 
respond. She did not pay attention. She was always a very attentive woman. She's always a very sensitive woman. And I've seen this on women here in Chicago. Not all of them. Some of them, it's a temporary thing, but for some of them, they have a terminal um, um, case of non-responsiveness. Pretty, fine, working every day. But they're non-responsive. Write that down. They're non-responsive. That means they're not sensitive to. This woman had lost her ability to be subject to be excited. All because somebody early in the day made a bad decision. This is in 24 hours. Please, you got to understand, you haven't lost your mind, sis. Please, forgive me if I sound sexist. I believe in the strong woman. The thing I love about my wife and sisters who understand their purpose, it's not just their education and their gifts, but their ability to be sensitive. My wife can look at flowers. She says, y'all see the pretty stuff in life. We need a centerpiece for the table. I'm a man. All we need is meat. <laughs> meat. We don't need a tablecloth. One fork will do. Now, I don't need a salad fork, but when a woman loses the ability to be sensitive, we in trouble. What does a community do? What do children do when their moms have lost their ability to love? No wonder you're mad. No wonder you... Bible says she did not respond to good news, did not pay attention, and she's an attentive woman. Last one, number six. Y'all got a minute? When worse comes to worse, when worse spreads, last one, it can redefine an entire generation. Not only does it affect the men, but it affects the older folks. It affects the women, and I say it affects Children. It ain't all they fall. Bible says more than 30,000 women are now widows. Neighborhood changes. You go from two family households to a great number of them are now single women. At least 30,000 of the 34 probably married Maurice. But all of those women, most of those women become widows, and then they're also what I call widows by extension. These are unmarried women who suffered because the pool of men has been so diminished, they'll never get married. And so though they've never buried a husband, they bury their future with a husband because if you ain't got a man to marry, Well, don't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. And her condition has caused her to look at her children different. And because she looks at her son different, she affects future men. Because boys do become men. And how you train a boy is how they become a man. So she named the boy Ichabod. In the days when names meant something. She named the boy Ichabod. The word Ichabod means the glory is not. It has three names. The glory is not. Brother, it also means where is the glory? And it also means inglorious. And for the first time in history, Somebody names their child an inglorious name. Because of her pain and her loss, physically, financially, her heart is broken. Her church is whack. She says, I'm going to call my son Ichabod. Why? The glory has departed from Israel. I wish I had time. So here's a boy that turns to a man who grows up without a mother who dies sad, grows up without a father, an uncle, or a granddaddy. The only people that are left 
to raise him. She leaves him in the arms of women that think it's okay just like it is. You be all right. He don't need nothing else. The Bible is good at tracing people's lives, especially brothers. And they'll tell you what they've done and what they've been. When you trace Ichabod's life, even trace his relationships. Read the word. It's in there. He never had a meaningful relationship with a woman his whole life. One of his siblings has a son. And the only thing that's named about his generation, Ichabod's nephew, stood in the courts of Solomon. So he lives his whole life. Every time they mention his name, Ichabod, what's up? He lives with a name that talks about lack. Every time they point to him, here comes Ichabod. No, he ain't got no daddy. Bouncing from house to house. There goes Ichabod. That's the Ichabod generation. Who's going to teach him how to shave? Who's going to teach him how to wear his pants? Who's who going to teach him? He, ain't gotta, he never played with his granddaddy. Never heard the whole old stories. And everybody tell him, just go do what you want to do because it's going to be all right. Ichabod. There was a movie last night I watched. Uh, I, I, I like watching uh, award shows. And I was watching last night the, 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 stat, the SAG Awards, Screen Actors Guild Awards. And one of the movies that actually wins a lot today, this year, and is going to win some Academy Awards, Brad Pitt has a title that comes from Ichabod's name. It's called Inglorious Bastards. It came from the Bible. No glory, no daddy. I told y'all it's going to be hard to preach this thing. <clears throat> so you read at the beginning of the lesson this song because things didn't stay that way. Thank God things don't stay that way. But as David took power, he got rid of the Philistines forever. They never rose up again. There was a man in David's court. The Bible says he was one of the leaders of David's choir, but he was also a Levite. And God dropped something in his spirit, and he wrote what we call the 61st, the 78th Psalm. Excuse me. 78th Psalm is different than the 23rd Psalm because it was written by a different person. He was in David's actual group, he was a, but he was a historian and he wanted to make sure, Asaph was his name, Asaph was a Levite, he was a, he was a man that, that understood history, and if you read that entire chapter, they call them the dark pages, the dark sayings, because he wanted people to remember what happens when God's people turn their back on God. And when you read this whole, this, we will have no songs about this, there'll be no revivals about this, but we need to understand that history records God is a deliverer. Yes, he is. But his people, the Bible says, that the Bible says, he wrote in verse 61, that God sent the ark of his might into captivity. You might have thought that the Philistines took it, but I'm here to let you know nobody takes anything from God. God, you can't wrestle your precious soul out of God. The devil himself can't take you away from God. God did this to himself. You read that scripture, it says, what will God, God has standards for his marriage. We can't live right, we're going to separate for a moment till we get this thing right again. God said, I will not live with a whoremonger. You can't take your love, Israel, outside this house and come back and lay in my bed. The Bible says he sent the ark of his might into captivity. It was a splendor. His, his physical presence, God said, I'll send an anointing away from the church. Till the church understand what it's got. I've heard many a person say, I wish I didn't left my husband. I wish I hadn't left my wife. I didn't know what I had. Verse 62, he gave his people over to the sword. He did it. He was angry with his inheritance. And before you get up and say, God gets mad at us, don't you get mad at your kids? Make it plain, Travis. Make it plain. 
Young, some of the young men died. Not the old, look, it's the young men. And the young women had no weddings. The preachers died. Listen to what God is saying. It's a history lesson. Stop blaming God for our problems. You can't, see America thinks it can buy itself out of everything. But I love what Matthew Henry says. Read it with me. Let's go. He said what? If God goes. Close your Bibles. Thank you for watching our telecast today. I thank you for your maturity. I thank you for your sensitivity to God's spirit. Somebody's been asking, God, how did all this, why is all this happening? Sometimes it's not your fault. Some, I'm not saying it's always the case, but there is precedent in scripture that God loves us so much, he won't let us live crooked. I thank God for that kind of love. I thank God for parents that still punish their children if they do wrong. They don't abuse them, they punish them and say, I want you to know how bad what you did was. As much as I love you, I'll put pain on you. Please stand with us. God bless you. Have a great day.